Hey gang, <clears throat> quick little, hopefully quick, uh, introductory video for Rostov 41. Not sure when I'm gonna share this or post it. Uh, not sure how far we're gonna get with the game or any of that nonsense, but I thought what was interesting as I was looking at this game, uh, and if you saw my, uh, my um, live stream first week of June, I was talking about what, what can I play in the next four days or five days because I have some time now where we're not uh, trying to sell the house or there's no meetings to sell the house or whatever they call showings. And so what, what could I do? And one of the things that popped up was Rostov 41 and I thought, hey, well, let's do that. Even though on the video I said I would play Ranger and some other game, I forget what it is now. But nevertheless, as I sat down to have a quick look at Rostov 41, I was struck by a couple of things. Uh, first off, uh, <clears throat> the brevity of the uh, specifics for this module in terms of the rules is really nice. There's a, a couple of little tweaks to sequence of play, which there usually always is with these SCS titles, standard combat series titles. And uh, some new, well, not new stacking rules because three, uh, three units is pretty typical. But here's the cool thing, it's regimental scale, which uh, is nice. So we get to sort of see a little bit of a breakdown of, of the units and whatnot. Uh, I, I thought that was uh, interesting. Well, let's see. Uh, and the, re the, <clears throat> the uh, there's an initiative role that has to happen here. And then there's also a uh, sequence of play tries to reflect some of the command issues that may have faced the Soviets by giving the Germans an opportunity to barrage before they move and after they move prior to combat, keeping in mind that only that each, each artillery unit can only fire once per turn. So with some nice sequencing there, you can DG units before you move, which will remove the, the uh, zones of control and allow you to kind of scoot around and behind. So that is a nice uh, reflection of the sort of the historical stuff going on. <clears throat> uh, I, I was struck, uh, particularly given who the original designer for this module was, the sort of somewhat pejorative names of the scenarios. You know, using the term Fritz, uh, I, I, I'm struck by that mainly because, you know, the designer is all about uh, being a little virtue signaler. And so I thought it was ironic that uh, he uh, chose the word Fritz on the Don and Fritz uh, on the Muse, not Muse, but Maus, I guess, for the river name. And then Fritz grabs Rostov. And then it's the Soviet counterpunch. Uh, so he didn't call them uh, the communists or the, the Reds or whatever, you know, whatever pejorative term would be appropriate for, for that. Here's what's really... Uh, curious to me about the scenario so for the main the main game let's have a look at where the victory conditions are and how they add up and stack up for the game and where the reinforcements come in and this is what might make this a pretty interesting interesting game to play <clears throat> so the green uh poker chits that you can see on the table here represents vp locations where's this one here in camera here so that's two vp if i Zoom in there, you've got to see it. So two VP for that location if the Germans capture it. Um, Germans need 18 to 21 uh, victory points for a major victory and 22 plus for a decisive victory. And uh, so that's how you can go capture, if you go capture Stalino, all of these little dudes here, these are all worth two, Stalino's five I think, no Stalino's three. Uh, two over here, all the way over to, who, who can pronounce that guy? I'll, I'll, I'll give someone a dollar if you can pronounce that for me in written format. Bolshek Rapinskaya, Rapinskaya, love it. Uh, two VP over here, then you've got uh, Shakti over here, which is five. Oh, you can't see it because I'm zoomed in. Uh, five over there. So if I can get capture as the access player, if you're the access player, I capture everything west of here, right? Excluding Rostov, I get a major victory. <clears throat> That's 18 or 19 VPs or something like that. 
uh, thereabouts. I, I don't recall exactly what it is. So, so that that is interesting in of itself. Obviously, then Rostov is worth a whole bunch of VPs. You get three VPs for getting a unit in there, but then you get five. I think it's five VPs, or sorry, it's fifteen VPs basically. Well, it's not five per hex because there's a bunch of hexes there. Let me just check it real quick before I go shoot my mouth off again. Uh, 15 for, for Rostov, all five hexes, that's right. 15 there, and then there's another five here if you capture these two as well. So there's the Rostov area. So you can see, you know, in most games, Rostov is one hex or two hexes. So this is, we're zoomed in on detail here. We're probably a couple of clicks a hex. It doesn't say, I don't think. Does it talk about the scale? Two and a half miles. There you go. Two and a half miles a hex, three to six days per term. We're starting in, uh, October sometime, October 13, and it runs through November, December. So, okay, so with all that in mind, you're like, wow, well, that's interesting. Here's another little uh, little twist on the on the gameplay. These two rivers, this river, the Krinka, and then the Mius. Any Soviet units in supply west of the river subtract a VP per unit from <clears throat> from the uh, German uh, you know VP tally so what this does uh, is kind of sets up this situation where there's going to have to be some counterattacking from the Soviets and uh, versus, versus the Axis right so the Axis are going to be in a rush I, I'm guessing in a rush to push in capture these guys as quick as they can uh, breach this river line and kill as many units as possible because the less units on the board, the uh, less chance there is of units ending up west of the river here. You've got uh, sort of your advanced uh, armored divisions here advancing and we'll see what happens with them. They could then push on to Rostov or they could just try and clean up and be happy with a, a major victory potentially. Uh, you could probably even get a decisive if you if you captured this here, uh, Novichokovsk, right? If you captured that, that would pull you in and still not have to take Rostov. Or you could ignore all that and capture Rostov and this and be real close and, and this and be real close to uh, a, a decisive uh, victory as well. That's another option. <clears throat> so here's what makes the, I think, the difference for this game and keeps it uh, it's sort of interesting if we look at the reinforcements and where the reinforcements come in that's going to be a significant factor so no reinforcements come in until until turn two and the first ones come in for the soviets over on the right hand side over here but then uh, on turn three they come in right here all right so there's nine uh six infantry units plus an at unit or an rd unit come in down here so that gives the and keep in mind that uh, the Soviets haven't the initiative for the first turn so they'll get to move first so these guys will probably invest Stalino and try and hold it uh, so that that means they're going to have control of Stalino receive reinforcements which could go here or here or or down here even so that makes that interesting tactically uh, then on the next uh, then you know, a few turns past turn six, E and F areas receive uh, five units, uh, five infantry units, so another division of Soviet infantry, keeping in mind they're all rated somewhere with a one combat factor and either a two, three, or a four defense, I think. Uh, so uh, that's, you know, pretty measly. More units coming in over here. Uh, for the Soviets so they can begin building some defenses there uh, Then turn seven more units over on this side of the map and, and down to support Rostov and then turn nine eight Infantry units plus seven other AT and artillery and other uh, sorted units doesn't really matter what they are except for the artillery Because they're all, all units are generic uh, so turn nine uh, that looks almost like a late push for them to come in here and see if they can't either cross the river because turn nine leaves us two, four, five turns out of the 14 left. Uh, either a late push to get across the river or recapture or reinforce 
uh, these these areas here, right? Uh, so that's interesting. And then turn ten, there's some more guy, a couple more units come in, a few a few units uh, drips and drabs. What's the counterpoint for for the access access on turn three? Area C over here received six units. Uh, turn five, they received six units. And turn six, they received nine units down here at area A. Kind of a long ways away from anywhere. So they're going to have to stay on this road for high speed movement uh, and then deal with the tracks and crap and then get across and do something. If they do something here, or maybe they go north. At some point and try and uh, try and assist in here or screen the river who knows what they're going to do there are some uh, reinforcements that come uh, did I mention turn two gets five up here I think I did yes turn two gets five units up here as well so <clears throat> so that sets up basically what looks like a very large meeting engagement in essence particularly up in this area of the map and might provide some interesting gameplay depending on on how things happen now here's one little one little catch for the soviets they also receive uh, whenever a unit is eliminated if it's an infantry unit uh, you roll a uh, 1d6 and on i think it's on a one through three it's a 50 50 chance that they will go into uh, back onto the turn track whatever that number is let's say it's one two or three uh, they go forward one turn and they will re-enter as a reinforcement wherever you want. Uh, if it's a three, it goes on the track three turns ahead and they come in as a reinforcement. If you're all four, five, or six, they're, uh, they're eliminated. So there's kind of this uh, constant uh, drip feed of units that are killed as well. Um, interestingly, too... With supply, if you're able to, per the rules, I think it's rule 12 in the standard rules from memory, uh, if you isolate these units, meaning zones of control that are not negated around these guys, for instance, when they become or are put in that situation, their defense is halved, their attack is halved, and I believe their movement is halved as well. Is that what it says? Is it movement? It's obviously movement. Half strength, half defense, and, and, and half move, yeah. No barrage, no exploit, and no Zoc. Ah, no Zoc either. All right, well, that's interesting. So that, uh, that will pose a problem for these guys if they can be, you know, if we could quickly surround them, they have a defensive value then of just one. Look at that. So that means I could get a seven to one attack on those guys if I came around behind them, get them, have them isolated. Have all these guys isolated and I can clean them out pretty quickly. So that's good to know. Uh, same sort of thing will probably then happen in and around Stalino. The turn two, three as these guys come on here and try and surround this stuff. The trick I think is going to be for the Soviet to be very aggressive and not worry about losses as usual. And for the Germans that they want to use their punching power to... Uh, isolate and eliminate and then their exploit movement capability to drive deep and capture free VPs but then they're gonna have to garrison those locations with high-powered you know five rated or four rated defensive units units that can defend well because you know garrisoning with a two is not going to work because they could surround you and they'll actually get a decent attack, a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one attack is not too bad, as you can see here, right? Well, one-to-one's pretty shitty. <laughs> but, you know, you've got a 50-50 chance of, of doing some damage, and that's probably good enough for the Soviets. Uh, so a two-to-one or a three-to-one is what they would need. And if you did surround them and they were isolated, that would halve them as well. So that's a bad thing. That, I think, makes for an interesting little exercise so i'm probably going to clip this real quick and we'll jump into it and i'll let you know what happens as we go later